There is no forensic evidence. There is no timeline to this crime. Scott Peterson is innocent. When Mr. Syed explains to his counsel's team that between school and uh, track practice, he would routinely, when school was in session, go to the Best Buy parking lot to have uh, a, a, a private encounter with Heyman Lee. I'm going to tell you I don't know what it looks like when someone's stabbed. Okay, you got to talk to someone that doesn't realize this. Tell us what you saw. Like it was all bleeding there. We're taking a closer look at notorious convicted killers who some say are innocent and why people are drawn to the peculiar phenomenon. If I'm attracted to this person and they're, you know, accused of this, maybe they're really innocent. And so they begin looking for evidence, I think, to support that desire, that, you know, that cognitive dissonance, and they wind up thinking, okay, this person is really innocent. Clinical and forensic psychologist Joni Johnston says the idea of a killer being innocent started long before modern day. You, know, you can go back and you can read these kind of anecdotes and stories of, um, you know, historical crimes when people would report these women showing up and waving their handkerchiefs, you know, at the person on trial and, and kind of fighting over this person. So we know that this phenomenon is complex and really kind of confusing as it is, is not new. Though modern technologies may have made the phenomenon more widespread. We are seeing so much more media coverage and people are so much more aware and there's some interviews and those kinds of things. So I think it definitely has broadened it. But I think that phenomena it has been around as long as there have been criminal trials. And because some convicted killers are later exonerated of their crimes, Johnston says some so-called fans may be more inclined to believe other murderers are innocent. So I think that, and there's been, of course, a lot of contention and some, you know, difficulty with relations between the media and the general public, certainly among certain groups. And so I think that does make it easier for people to, you know, from a practical standpoint. For some, the case of Stephen Avery fits into this mold. Made famous by the 2015 Netflix documentary series Making a Murderer, Avery and his nephew Brendan Dassey have a large following who maintain the pair are innocent. Both were tried and convicted in the 2005 murder of Teresa Halbach. I think Mark and I both feel that maybe there's some, some more that you could tell us um, that you may have held back for whatever reasons. And I don't want to assure you that Mark and I both are in your corner. We're on your side, and you did tell us yourself that one of the reasons you hadn't come forward yet was because you were afraid, you were scared, and, and one of the reasons you were scared was that you would be implicated in this, or people would say that you helped or did this, mm -hmm. okay, and that you might get arrested and stuff like that, okay, and we understand that. One of the best ways to, to, to prove to us or more importantly, you know, the courts and stuff, is that you tell the whole truth. Don't leave anything out. Don't make anything up because you're trying to cover something up a little. Um, and even if those statements are against your own interest, you know what I mean? That, that makes you, might, it may, might make you look a little bad or make you look like you were more involved <coughs> than you want to be uh, looked at. Um, it's hard to do, but it's good from that vantage point to say, hey, there's no doubt you're telling the truth because you've now given the whole story. You've even given points where it didn't look real good for you either. And I don't know if, I, if you, you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we kind of came here to let you talk a little, maybe get some stuff off your mind or chest if you need to, and then to tell us the whole truth, to take us through this whole thing that happened on Monday. Not leaving anything out, not adding anything in. Some fans claim Dassey, who was only 16 years old at the time of his arrest, gave a false confession to investigators. They argue he should not be behind bars. Thousands of these so-called fans are part of multiple Facebook groups devoted to Dassey and Avery's innocence. The groups prompt discussions where true crime fans discuss the intricacies of the case or claim to bring new information to the table. 
Experts say it may be part of Avery's history that leads to such a big following who believe he is innocent. Just two years before Halbach's murder, Avery was exonerated after serving 18 years in prison for a 1985 rape. For his entire sentence, Avery maintained his innocence, arguing he never raped the victim. Experts say Avery's exoneration in that case may lead these fans to believe he's innocent regardless of his most recent conviction. I think that does make it easier for people to, you know, from a practical standpoint, question. Just because somebody was convicted, does that mean that they're guilty? Well, look at this case, look at this case, look at this person who was just exonerated after 30 years. So there is this practical part of it, I think, as well. That, you know, and that's a that's a good thing that you know, we don't always accept the fact that somebody who's convicted is always guilty. So there's that kind of practical part of it. And then but Johnston says backers of Dassey and Avery may be missing the facts of the case, instead basing their theories on emotions. A lot of times our decisions um, are based on emotion and they were looking for kind of evidence and reasons to support those emotions or that are, you know, or, or, and so I think sometimes that happens here, you know, so for people who, let's say I am looking on these websites and listening to these interviews and I'm attracted to this person and I'm thinking, how can I be attracted to this person that has been, is on trial for this horrible crime or convicted of this horrible crime? Now, again, if there's the people who are interested in it for that reason, but I think there are other people who are like, there's this kind of cognitive distance, like I, I, this can't be true. So one, but one of these can't be true. If I'm attracted to this person and they're, you know, accused of this, maybe they're really innocent. And so they begin looking for evidence, I think, to support that desire, that, you know, that cognitive dissonance, and they wind up thinking, okay, this person is really innocent. Johnston's theory of attraction applies to some backers of convicted murderer Scott Peterson, who believe the wife killer is actually innocent. I think everybody sitting at home wants the answer to the same question. Did you murder your wife? No, no, I did not. Peterson's case rose to fame in late 2002 after his pregnant wife Lacey went missing on Christmas Eve from their Modesto, California home. She's got a face clean and hook, like I said, she's walking and the kids will pull her. Um, take the dog for a walk and then she's going to the store to buy for Christmas morning breakfast tomorrow. And that was going to be a involved prep. So that was her afternoon, just prepping the breakfast, and she's gonna make gingerbread cookies for tonight. Months after her disappearance, the bodies of Lacey and her unborn son Connor were found separately in the San Francisco Bay. Scott had previously told law enforcement he went fishing in the bay the day Lacey disappeared. When did you realize you were gonna go fishing? Oh, well, that was a morning decision. It's either go, oh, morning, so play golf at the club or, or go fishing. Okay. Um, seemed too cold to go play golf at the club, so um, yeah, just decided to, you know, 930 or whatever that. In 2004, Peterson was convicted of Lacey and Connor's murders. He was originally sentenced to death, but in 2020, the Supreme Court of California overturned that sentence but upheld the convictions. Scott is in prison. He's been in prison for over 18 years for a crime he did not commit. That's the foundation of the question you're asking is how is he doing? That's a very heavy, heavy load to bear. It's a very heavy load to bear. We're focused on justice, we're focused on what's ahead of us, and we're focused on the fact that he will be granted a new trial. Peterson's team further alleged juror misconduct in his trial, arguing juror Rochelle Neese, nicknamed Strawberry Shortcake, lied on her juror questionnaire, withholding information that she was a victim of domestic violence. In 2022, Nice was granted immunity from perjury prosecution and testified she had no ill will against Peterson. A judge later resentenced Peterson to life in prison and denied granting him a new trial. Meanwhile, Peterson and some family members have maintained his innocence. The problem started when Lacey went missing and the Modesto police did not follow up on sightings or evidence that she was alive. They focused strictly on my brother-in-law because he was having an affair. And as you heard today in a sentencing hearing, you did not hear one detail about how this crime occurred. You heard details about my brother-in-law's infidelity. 
and my brother-in-law ordering pornography on a cable news station. This is a murder trial. This is a capital murder trial. He is in prison for murdering his wife and unborn son. There is no forensic evidence. There is no timeline to this crime. Scott Peterson is innocent. While some supporters believe Peterson is innocent based on alleged facts, Johnston says others may have reached that conclusion based on Peterson's appearance. I mean, you really, do, it really does kind of run the gamut all the way from people who say things like, you know, this person's too cute to have committed this murder. You know, like, I'm sorry, but there's zero correlation between physical attractiveness, you know, and, and what kind of crime that you commit, you know, all the way to people who are seemingly kind of ignoring some of the evidence that's, you know, kind of showing guilt or implying guilt and focusing on these, you know, the reasonable doubt piece of it. I think the other part of that, though, is that those are the cases that get the high profile anyway. So when you look at the people who are covered, it tends to be people that we don't expect to be murderers, right? They're, you know, of a different socioeconomic class. They're professionals. Uh, they don't have a criminal history. They are good looking. They're kind of charismatic. So the coverage is greater for these particular individuals. And then people who are watching, uh, they, they are attractive. And so I absolutely think both of those things kind of feed on each other. Michael Peterson was also convicted in the murder of his wife, with a collection of backers maintaining his innocence for more than a decade. His case documented closely in the documentary series The Staircase, which most recently was adapted into an HBO miniseries. Once a prominent novelist, Peterson was arrested in 2001 and charged with the murder of his wife, Kathleen Peterson. Peterson maintained he found Kathleen at the bottom of the staircase in their Durham, North Carolina home. Prosecutors argued Peterson knowingly murdered his wife and staged it as an accident. They alleged he had motive to kill after Kathleen learned of his bisexuality. In 2003, Peterson was found guilty in Kathleen's murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. But years later, in 2010, Peterson was released on $300,000 bail and granted a new trial based on expert testimony in his 2003 case. Officials found North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation analyst Dwayne Deaver gave, quote, deliberately false testimony in Peterson's case. Rather than go to trial again, Peterson entered an Alford plea in 2017. That means Peterson maintains his innocence, but accepts there is enough evidence to convict him. Peterson was sentenced to a maximum of 86 months in prison, but was released on time served. Throughout the nearly 20-year ordeal, Peterson's children, adoptive and biological, stood by his side. After the release of the Staircase documentary, fans took a closer interest in the case and its details. Johnston says for some, online research of this kind can create a warped view of the case. It, almost in any case, are some facts that you kind of go, huh, I'm not quite sure how that fits. So they're just kind of choosing to focus on those facts and ignoring all of these facts, you know, over here. And so once they kind of come to that conclusion, they stick with it um, and use that as evidence to kind of further support that. And then you find when you have these face group books, groups that are supporting this person's innocent, it becomes almost like an echo chamber right, where they're all focusing and, and kind of reinforcing each other about this person's innocence and the fact that there's a miscarriage of justice and this person is a victim in some way because they're, they shouldn't be on trial, et cetera, et cetera. Peterson's case is not unique in fans getting involved. After the release of popular podcast Serial, covering the 1999 murder of Baltimore teenager Heyman Lee, Fans across the globe began backing convicted murderer Adnan Syed and closely following his case. Syed, Lee's ex-boyfriend, was arrested for her murder when he was just 17 years old and a senior in high school. After his first trial ended with a hung jury, Syed was convicted in 2000 and sentenced to life in prison plus 30 years. But 14 years later, the podcast serial premiered, reigniting interest in Syed's case. This is a global tail link prepaid call from Adnan Syed. An inmate at a Maryland Correctional Facility. In the series, journalist Sarah Koenig explored facts in Syed's case and the lack thereof. Some fans taking to social media in support of Syed argued he should not be imprisoned and deserved another trial. 
Following the release of Serial, a Maryland judge reopened Syed's post-conviction relief hearings. The arguments surrounded alleged ineffective counsel on the part of Syed's attorney, Christina Gutierrez. His new team argued Gutierrez failed to flesh out a potential alibi for Syed based on a letter written by one of his former classmates. In Syed's trials, Maryland prosecutor alleged he murdered Heyman Lee in a Best Buy parking lot miles from their school. But Syed's former classmate, Asia McLean, said she remembered seeing Syed at the high school library during that time frame. McLean wrote Syed a letter about their interaction at the library after he was arrested, but says she was never contacted by Gutierrez. Asia wrote out an affidavit on the spot. In it, she says she and Anand spoke for about 15 to 20 minutes while she was waiting for her boyfriend to give her a ride. Quote, we left around 2.40, unquote. Remember, Hay is supposed to be dead by 2.36. And then the kicker. No attorney has ever contacted me about January 13th, 1999 and the above information. In 2010, Syed's team filed appeals based on this claim, but it wasn't until after Serial's release that the proceedings were reopened. The claims were appealed multiple times, eventually being presented in front of the Supreme Court of Maryland in 2019. The record is not silent on whether or not Ms. McLean was contacted. The state agrees with that. The record is silent on the critical question of why. On that particular question of why Ms. Gutierrez decided uh, as Strickland put it, to conclude that one investigative path was unnecessary, the record is silent. The Court of Appeals at E107 says, because of trial counsel's death, there is no record of why trial counsel decided not to make any attempt to contact McLean and investigate the importance or not of her testimony to Syed's defense. And in fact, defense counsel acknowledges this. On page 25 of their brief, uh, defense counsel writes, this record in this case reveals no contemporaneous tactical consideration that could have justified trial counsel's failure to even contact McLean. Uh, later in the page, because there is no evidence of any contemporaneous judgment that trial counsel made in reaching this decision, only a resounding lack of follow through, there is no tactical decision meriting a presumption of reasonableness. What they are suggesting is that if we don't have evidence of a tactical decision, the presumption does not apply. But that's exactly backwards. The, uh, Mr. Syed's obligation is to establish the reason as unreasonable. That is how you overcome the presumption of reasonableness. Record evidence that Ms. McLean was not contacted is not complete the gap. The gap is as to why Ms. Gutierrez did not complete uh, to contact Ms. McLean. At the time, Syed was denied a new trial, but just last year, Syed's conviction was vacated after the state of Maryland filed a motion arguing prosecutors had committed Brady violations after they did not turn over exculpatory evidence during Syed's trial. The move sparked backlash from Heyman Lee's family, and a state appellate court later reinstated Syed's conviction. Most recently, a Maryland Supreme Court blocked the reinstatement of his conviction in May. Just last week, the Maryland Attorney General asked the state Supreme Court to grant certiorari to Syed, meaning they're asking the higher court to hear the lower court's decision. There's power in numbers, and I think it serves a psychological and social needs that we have to be a part of a group that is like us. And, you know, on the positive side, I mean, we've seen so many people who've joined forums for missing people and they're in part of a group and they're actively looking for a certain person and they're they're going out to search and they're rallying and they're having these vigils and things like that, which is kind of the flip side of that, where this group is, you know, and you have people who, I mean, I've interviewed people who are just consumed with the case and they've never met anybody. They, they don't know the family, they don't know friends. And I think in some respects, it gives them a sense of purpose. Um, something about that case, for whatever reason, has touched them. Um, each person has their own reason, I think, for why this case touched them. And they'll just go down the rabbit hole looking for, you know, to, to, you know, to, they get so involved in. Oftentimes, when convicted killers have a supportive following, Johnston says it's because their cases were highly publicized. Ten years ago, in 2013, it was the case of Jody Arias that captivated viewers. After the then 28-year-old was indicted for the 2008 murder of her ex-boyfriend, Travis Alexander. Alexander was found with 27 knife wounds, including a slit throat and a gunshot wound to the head. 
Prosecutors argued Arias was upset with Alexander after he broke off their relationship. The defense argued Alexander was abusive toward Arias, saying she killed him only after he physically came after her. Court-appointed defense attorney Kirk Nurmi headed Arias' defense team. In a conversation with Long Crime Network's Jesse Weber, he says the case still follows him. People ask me, do I loathe her, that sort of thing, and I really don't. I don't have a lot of feelings towards her. It's part of my past. I'm not a fan, but uh, I just kind of was part of my life, and, and I move on from there. I don't give her a lot of thought. Thousands of people follow a support page for Arias titled Jody Arias Support. Similarly to other online support forums, the page includes news articles about Arias and discussions about the case. But Nurmi tells us he believes his former client committed murder. I believe Ms. Arias went over to Mr. Alexander's house. I believe there were some issues. Um, she was trying to get some things from him and things turned into murder. In May 2017, Arias was found guilty of first degree murder. She was up for the death penalty, but after back-to-back -back hung juries resulted in two sentencing mistrials, Arias was given a life sentence without possibility of parole. I think uh, justice played out, and like I say in my book, she's, she's where she should be. In the end, Johnston believes the surge in true crime popularity has likely increased the number of supporters some convicted killers have. But she also says the growing popularity of the genre can shed light on otherwise forgotten cases. I think in general, the true crime community has been a very positive overall. I really do. I think most of us who've been in this space, um, we've become more educated. We've become more aware. I think people are more willing to speak up when they see something that's not right. I think people have become more you know, active in terms of helping missing persons and, and advocating for laws that support victims and, um, and those kinds of things. But I think we need to be informed consumers. And, and, that, and that is informed consumers, not only in terms of the facts of, of the case and, and making sure we have those, those facts, but also again, in terms of um, sensitive to the fact that these are families and they are real people. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Sierra Gillespie.